I've been in a series risen. This is message two this morning. It's a subject that I'm very passionate about. It's a subject that I believe is missing in most churches. Maybe not as a subject, but certainly as a mission of the church. It's something we sweep under the rug. It's an act that we don't take very seriously in the church. And if we're going to see revival in this nation, if we're going to see revival here at Abba's house, we're going to see revival coast to coast, then we better make this a matter of priority in the days ahead. We have got to reject everything that is religion and embrace everything that is kingdom. If I could do anything in this atmosphere, it would be to totally unplug you from everything religion has taught you and inject you with the kingdom of God. The title of my message this morning is Risen for Restoration. Risen for Restoration. I believe that it is the job of every Christian to be a change agent in the lives of other people. I believe it is the role and responsibility of every church not to throw away people who've fallen into sin, but to lift them back up and to show them the right way. I believe it should be our mission, not only our mission, but our identity as believers. I'm fed up with churches sweeping things under the rug for the people they like and exposing the darkness in those we don't like. I'm telling you the gospel ought to be the same for everybody, rich, poor, red, yellow, black, white, Republican, Democrat. His grace is sufficient for all of us. And I am sick and tired of the media rejoicing when people fall. If it's conservative media, they rejoice when the non-conservative leader falls. If it's liberal media, they rejoice when a conservative falls. You know, if it's an atheist, they're celebrating when a Christian pastor sins or falls short of God's glory. None of that's the kingdom of God. And as Christians, we shouldn't be a part of any of that mess. We ought to help people get back up and get off the ground. And we ought to bandage their wounds and tell them who they can be, not who they are not. Last week, we preached to you from Romans chapter 6. We talked about our identification with the Savior. We identify with God in his death, in the burial, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We identify with Jesus in three ways. But we don't just identify with God as a human being. We identify with the mission that Jesus called us to. He called us to a mission to a kingdom greater than that of ourselves. And it's time that we move into the mission that God has called us to. There is a process to understanding God. And many times we skip the first step in understanding and truly knowing God. And because we skip the first step, we end up in a sinful mess later in our lives. The first thing you must understand about God is that he is a loving God. You must see God through the eyes of beloved identity, that God loves you with an everlasting love. On your worst day, he still loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Not only that, he formed you, he created you. He has a plan of grace and escape and divine dominion and purpose for your life. He loves you and he longs for intimacy with you. Many believe that is why Adam and Eve were even created for intimacy with God. Perichoresis, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit doing that spiritual unity dance. But yet we embrace Jesus as a figure, but not as God. We don't have intimacy with God. And if you understand that in the secret place of the Most High, Psalms 91, that there is a special treasure there for you. When you seek Jesus, you will find him. When you love Jesus, he'll love you back with an everlasting love. When you connect with Jesus Christ, there are things that can't be explained. There is a divine union that comes from the Trinity that can only be experienced in intimacy. And if you just were scared of going to hell and you prayed a prayer, yes, you're saved. But my friend, you're missing the mark. You're missing intimacy with God and when you understand that he loves you you'll long to please him when you understand that he loves you you'll want to do what he's called you to do when you understand that he loves you 
better than the world could ever love you, then it will change the game in your life. So beloved identity leads to divine calling. Once you get the intimacy part right, then you'll know what you're supposed to do in the kingdom of God. Many of us, we want to do something for God, but we don't get the intimacy part right and we get out here and we start serving God, man, we're doing it in our own flesh and we're just doing it and we're sweating, man, we're serving God, we're looking for results. Man, we really like it when you tell me good job and man, I want everybody to like me and I'm doing this to get you to amen me or follow me on Twitter. Oh, please like me. And the reason we're please like me, share me, follow me is because we didn't get the identity part right. See, once you get the identity part right and you realize that God loves you, that you don't need man's approval to do what God's called you to do. You don't need everybody to like you. You don't need eight million followers on social media that God has called you. Then you can say what God says. Then you can do what God does, whether people like you or not. Because Jesus said that this wasn't gonna be easy. He said people are gonna hate you for taking this narrow way. And so once you understand who you are in Christ and he loves you, then you can start operating in your calling. The reason why Christians fall, the reason why Christians fail, the reason why leaders fall short of God's glory at times, and we've all done it, is because we get away from the intimacy part, we get away from being, and we focus on doing. And if all you're focused on is what you're doing for Jesus, then you're gonna miss the intimacy part. And if you miss the intimacy part, my friend, that's when the enemy can come in and eat your lunch and twist your mind and get you off track. Intimacy is the key to the fruit of the spirit with Jesus Christ. So you go from beloved identity to divine calling, then you get into family dynamics. The more spiritual way to say that is generational legacy. Never forget that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is a generational legacy God. God's best plan from the Garden of Eden now has always been generational legacy, spiritual legacy. The devil hates that. The devil hates sonship, daughtership, passing of the torch, succession. The devil hates that, but that was God's original intent and plan. We as kingdom ambassadors are to reconnect people to God's original intent and plan for their lives. So we have family dynamics. Family dynamics, understanding that if the enemy can't get to you, he's going after your kids. If he can't get to your kids, he's going after your grandkids. The enemy's looking for a foothold or a loophole to come in and destroy us. And no matter how much intimacy you got, you better learn how to intercede. Move from intimacy to intercession because you better learn how to pray on behalf of somebody else. You better learn how when the things get dark and things are happening that can't be explained and there's pain in your body from what you're going through. And man, you didn't deserve it. You didn't ask for it, but you're in the middle of a mess. You better learn how to go to the throne room of Jesus Christ on behalf of somebody else. And in the kingdom, when you do that for others, when you're going through hell, I believe that God's people will step up and be praying on your behalf when you can't pray for yourself. Family dynamics, generational legacy. And then as Brian talked to us about today, kingdom economics. I'll save that for another day. But kingdom economics, then you can start the sowing and reaping and all of these different things. But it starts with intimacy. Intimacy. Romans chapter eight says that those of us who are led by the spirit are the children of God. When you accept Jesus Christ, you are connected to a family and a father. It's more than religion. It's more than being a good Baptist or a good church of God or whatever you are, a good Catholic. When you accept Christ, you enter into a new family. You enter into a relationship with Abba Father. You, you guarantee a future for yourself and those that will follow after you. That is the kingdom message from God. And 1 John 3 says, see what kind of love the Father, everybody say the Father, has given to us that we should be called, all of us, children of God. So, as children of God, a part of this kingdom and global family, when one of our own makes a mistake or falls into sin or a snare, what do we do? What do we do? We restore them. The word restoration in the dictionary is the act or process of returning something to its original condition by repairing it, cleaning it, 
or rebuilding it. It is the act of bringing something back that existed before. It is the act of returning something that was stolen or taken from you. In the kingdom of God, it is the act of rebuilding to make better. In the Bible, it means to mend a net, which was very a very careful process in those days, mending a net. You had to mend it, detailed. You could not leave the holes big because you did not want the fish to get through the holes, so it had to be strong. You had to use the right materials, and it was a very strategic and a careful process to mend and make a net. This is the careful process of restoring someone you love back to their original state, restoring them back to their original identity in Christ. That is what we have tried to accomplish. Here in this church, I've had the privilege many times of restoring people who've fallen, and it is a blessing. Now, I could give you statistics and tell you 50% of the restorations took and the other 50 didn't. But here's the reality, who really cares? One's worth it. We serve a God that will leave the masses and go after the one. We serve a God who compared himself to a father whose son stole everything from him and left and came home ashamed and instead of waiting for the son to apologize, God the father ran off the porch kissing the son who'd made the mistake. We serve a God that through his son Jesus allowed himself to be betrayed by his closest Judas, denied by his best Peter, but yet instead of holding them accountable, Jesus brought it all the way back with the apostle Peter to intimacy. Hey, do you love me? Forget what you did. Forget what you said when they crucified me. Do you still love me and want purpose? And I'm asking that to somebody. Do you still love him? And do you still want to be used by God? Because if you do, he'll use you. But you cannot allow the enemy to defeat you and push you down any longer. If you've confessed it, God heard it. And if God heard it, he forgave it. And if he forgave it, your restoration is underway. It's taking place right now in the spirit. God used Elijah to bring restoration to the widow's house. God restored Joseph, who was one of the first victims of human trafficking, sold into slavery by his brother. And everywhere he went, whether it was the prison or Potiphar's house or whatever turmoil he found himself in, the favor of God, the Bible says in Genesis, was on him wherever he went. So no matter what's happened to you, even if it was unfair, when you have intimacy, perichoresis with God, then friend, his favor will be on your life every step of the way. God restores temples. He's restored the nation of Israel. He restores his remnant. He restores tribes. He restores everything in between. It is who God is. The Bible says in Acts that heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for him to restore everything. We've been teaching you about that on Wednesday nights. The Bible says in Isaiah 61, instead of shame, you'll receive a double portion. And Zechariah says the same thing. You see, religion operates in shame and guilt. The kingdom operates in redemption and purpose. Religion operates in shame and guilt. The kingdom operates in restoration and purpose. Jeremiah 30, verse 17, and I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal, declareth the Lord, because they have called you an outcast. It is Zion for whom no one cares. Have you ever been called an outcast? I have. I gotta be honest, I kinda like it. It gets me going. I don't wanna be like everybody else. I don't want you to be like everybody else. They called Jesus an outcast. Aren't we to identify with him? See, some of you need to be delivered today from everybody liking you. What do you care if they like you or not? Because I'm gonna tell you, the people that love you, they're gonna love you no matter what you do. And the people that don't like you, 
They're not going to like you no matter what you do. So dust yourself off, start advancing the kingdom, and move on. I'll restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Our text today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning with verse 14. For Christ's love, going back to beloved identity, his love compels us. That has to be the root, the foundation, that's where we begin. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. My favorite verse in the Bible. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I've taught you that before. It is the process of change. It takes time. I'm not as bad as I used to be, not as good as I'm going to be. It is progressive change to the spirit of the living God. But that's not the point of my message today. Verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Everybody say that with me, the ministry of reconciliation. Now we're getting into our divine purpose. Beloved identity has been taken care of. What is our mission as kingdom believers, sons and daughters? What has God called us to do? It says he's reconciled himself to us and has now given us, hit your neighbor and say he's talking to you. The ministry of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. God wants his church to be in the restoration and the reconciliation business. It's not enough for us to just keep pushing people away. We are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his special appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God first. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God's reconciling the world to himself through his son Jesus, not counting people's sins against him. And now he's given us this wonderful ministry of reconciliation. But he says here at the end, be reconciled to God first. Let's talk restoration just a minute. So, restoration always begins vertically. Is everybody with me? Y'all do this so I can tell you're alive. Okay. Vertically. What happens typically in ministry or politics or business or it, this isn't just about church. It's about every aspect of life. Hollywood, whatever you want to talk about. When someone falls from grace, sometimes what you'll see happen is they're more worried about saving their butt than they are their soul. For instance, let's just let's put it into ministry right now because that's the work I deal in. If a preacher screws up, if they're first trying to save their ministry, you have a problem. If a preacher screws up and they're first trying to save their bank account, you have a problem. Because restoration starts vertically. So what you want to hear is what David said in Psalm 51. Created me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. What you want to hear from anyone, doesn't matter what line of business they're in or what kingdom form of government they're in, you want people to cry out to God first. You want them to work on their vertical relationship with God first. That is the way of the kingdom. But many times we want to start fixing marriage and bank accounts and followers and church and let's fix all these other things. Problem is, if you, it goes back to what I said at the beginning of this message. It begins and ends with beloved identity. If you don't get the relationship with God piece right, then everything else you try to add to your plate is going to be a mess that won't go away or clean itself up. 
begins vertically, being reconciled to God. My biggest problem in my life, and this has been told to me since I was a young person, is I typically want things for people who don't want it for themselves. And I've had mentors and coaches and friends and preachers for my whole life say, you want it more than they do. You cannot make them serve God. You cannot make them have a better life. You cannot make them think differently. Stop wanting for people what they don't want for themselves. It's been told to me my whole life. And I have to have staff around me to protect me because of my grace gift. Because I will look at you and I will see the beginning of your story, the middle and the end, and I'll see God and the heavens rejoicing and this wonderful testimony coming to full blossom. But the problem is I see this and I believe in grace so much that I see what restoration can do. But occasionally I put the cart before the horse because the person I'm seeing this for can't see it for themselves and doesn't want it for themselves. So I've wasted a lot of time and I've made some mistakes trying to believe for people who refuse to believe for themselves. You've got to believe that you can have it. You've got to believe that God will forgive you. You've got to grab hold of the truths of God's word for yourself and move forward. Your parents can't want it for you. Your preacher can't want it for you. Your business owner can't want it for you. Your life group leader can't want it for you. You've got to want it for yourself. For yourself. And you got to believe the truth of God's word. Number one, our obligation to restoration. Our obligation to restoration. Galatians 6. Brethren, brothers and sisters, if a person is overtaken in any trespass, sin means to miss the mark. Trespass means to miss the mark to a degree that you've crossed the line and you're on ground that you shouldn't be on. So it's not just, hey, I slipped up and made a mistake. A trespass means it's not just a slip up, it's a lifestyle. Now you're on ground you should have never been on. You're on the verge of iniquity, which is trafficking with demons. So you've been overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual. Here's what that word means, spiritual in the Greek. It's in creche, and here's what it means, because you need to know it. It means strong, having mastered a thing, and mature. It's not you who think you are spiritual, because some of you think you're spiritual and you're not. Because you think speaking in tongues is what makes you spiritual and it's not. Having spiritual maturity in knowing how to redeem or reconcile or restore someone is the fruit of the spirit. Speaking in tongues is for you. When you can move your mindset off you to other people, that's spiritual maturity. When you don't have to have the credit, that's spiritual maturity. When you'll take the bullet to protect someone else, from going through a difficult time, that's spiritual maturity. So restoration is not for everybody. You've got to be at a certain place with Jesus in order to restore anybody. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Not you sorry, no good sinner, you ain't never gonna be worth the flip, you better repent or you're gonna burn in hell, bless God. That don't sound like a spirit of gentleness, does it? Restore someone in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. I had a pastor tell me one time, said, Pastor Ron, you preach this great stuff all the time, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, you love it, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. He said, you know what? When you preach grace and you restore people, you're building up your bank of grace for you for a later day. I said, praise God, because I'm going to need a lot of it. Bear one another's burdens. Hmm. Just let this resonate. Let this resonate in your spirit. Let the word of God dwell richly in your heart. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You are more closely connected to Jesus when you're carrying the load for someone else than when you're boasting in your own flesh. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one Examine his own work, then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If he sows to his flesh, he's going to reap a flesh harvest. If he sows to the spirit, he's going to reap a spiritual harvest. Everlasting life. And then it says to the saints, 
Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So our obligation to restoration, we as a church are called to restore people, but church, we can't restore them if they don't repent. I can't restore them if they don't see that they're out of alignment with God. I can't restore them if they're continuing in what they were doing that got them out of fellowship with God. Now I can try and bless God I try to my last breath. I'm not looking for perfection from people. I'm just looking for a passion for Jesus and honesty. But we can't restore them if they don't repent. Our obligation though is to restoration. Our obligation is to show people that through the spirit of God, there is a way out. There is a new path. There is a restoration. There is a comeback, amen? Number two, our ownership and restoration. You have to own it when you blow it. You have to own it when you blow it. King David understood this. I'm not gonna go through the whole situation here, but I'll, I'll mention it. I mean, King David's a man after God's own heart. King David knew how to worship, man. King David's mama was a loose woman and his daddy hated him, but God called him. But he always had this intimacy with God and what we see here is when he should have been with his soldiers and his brothers fighting, he, he's at home and he, he's not in intimacy with God and he looks over the balcony and he sees a naked woman and he's, he starts lusting and then his lust grows legs and before too long, he's had an affair with this woman and, and her husband's his best soldier and best friend. Then he tries to cover it up. He tries everything from getting the guy you ride drunk and all this craziness to ends up having this man move to the front lines of the war and being killed to cover up his sin. Awful. I mean, this guy's all in the word of God and this is what he did. I tell you, don't look too harsh at him. Because Jesus said, if you just look on somebody with that spirit, it's the same as committing adultery. And that's the biggest thing, reason we're having trouble reaching people in the church is we make a bigger deal out of one kind of sex than we do another. We make a bigger deal out of one kind of sin than we do another. And we need to start calling all sin, sin, and not just pick the political sins and highlight them. Sin's a sin. Sin is a sin. Whether you're on your computer playing at home or you're with someone of the same sex, it's a sin, it's all a sin. And we either need to get real about it or we can sweep it under the rug. But I believe that God's calling us higher to a standard of restoration. And so all of this happens. D David had not lost his salvation, but he lost his intimacy with God. He'd, lost his passion because of the guilt and the shame on his life. And it says in Psalm 51, oh, have mercy on me, oh God. See, it was vertical. Have mercy on me, God. No, no I, I want to keep my kingdom. I want to keep my influence. I want to keep my wealth. No, it was, oh, have mercy on me, God. According to your kessed, your loving kindness, I want my intimacy restored with you. I want my relationship back with you. I don't care if I ever serve as king again. I don't care if I get to build the temple. I don't care if I have the wealth that I've had. I just want to be in unity with you. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge what I've done. And my sin is always before me. Against you and you only I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. And later he says in verse five, I was brought forth in iniquity. And what I believe is going on here, why he would even mention this is because like many of us, when we blow it, 
we can start hitting rewind on our life and see different moments where mama left me or daddy left me or I stepped into this or I was abused. And he starts going back and he says, you know what? I see when the devil came in this thing and his plan was to ruin me from the beginning. And I see where it happened. It happened when I was conceived. He says, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins and blot them out. Our obligation in restoration. First step is to confess your sins, my friend. This is not telling God all of our sins. You know, when I was little, I remember thinking, being raised Baptist, that if I forgot one sin, I'd go back to hell to confess. He knows them all. It's not for his benefits you confess them, it's for yours. It's agreeing with God about sin. What does God say about it? He says it'll defeat you, it'll ruin you, it'll cause shame and heaviness on your life if not dealt with. Transgression means a felony, the breaking of covenant. Confession is not what you think is wrong. It's what God says about it. You see, we want to get into semantics of how to explain things to a lost world around us. And, and now, if you say something is a sin, you automatically have a phobia of that. It's not true. We all have it in our lives. We all battle it. So to c- call something a sin is not to have a phobia against it. It's just an admission that we are in a body of flesh and we need spiritual resurrection and purpose. Fellowship is restored when we own what we did. If you want fellowship back with God, you've got to own what you did. Your fullness is restored as it was for David when you confess what you did. So you can't confess it if you don't own it. See, there's too many people in church that are never wrong. Never wrong. It's never their fault. They can never see one thing they could have done better. Confession removes the sin. Ownership acknowledges the sin. And God restores the Holy Spirit. That's what I love what it says in verse 10 and 11 of Psalm 51. David said, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. Isn't that powerful? He said, you can, and David had it all, man. He said, you can take everything. Lord, just don't take your spirit from me. Don't take that spirit from me that I felt tending to the sheep. Don't take that spirit from me that I grabbed a hold of when I defeated Goliath. Don't take that spirit from me that promoted me to king and that gave me strength. Don't take that spirit from me. Our future is restored when we move from ownership to confession and we commit to God's purpose for our life. This is how David flips it. This is what I love. He said, listen, I want you to restore to me the joy of my salvation. In other words, Lord, I want to feel like I did when I first was forgiven and had communion with you. And he says, listen, Lord, if you'll do this, if you'll restore my soul, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. See, if you've been restored, and if you're saved, you've been restored. You're just in denial. If you've been restored, it is your obligation to restore others back to fellowship. It's your obligation. You have an obligation to do it, and then you have to walk them through the process of owning what they did, restoring their relationship with God vertically so that God can use them spiritually again. Number three, our obsession with restoration. Obsession means to be consumed. Jesus was consumed and obsessed with restoration. He was. Everything Jesus did, from restoring the old man to the new man, to the old nature to the new man, to the old ways, the old covenant of law, into the new covenant of grace, tearing down the middle wall of separation, we become one new man because of who Jesus was. He was consumed with restoration. 
And if in Romans 6 we're to identify with the person and the passion and the pursuit of Jesus, then friend, we also have to be consumed with restoration. It says this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him, here's that word again, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and my favorite part, and free from accusation. Somebody say that with me, free from accusation. If you've confessed your sin and you're still carrying around the guilt, that's not of God. Amen. That is not of God. The Bible says, therefore, there is now no condemnation or guilt to those who are in Christ Jesus. If other people are limiting you because of what you've done in your past, move on from them to a people that will embrace you and see you the way Jesus sees you. First Peter chapter five, verse 10, but may the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish strength and settle you. Jesus was consumed with restoration. I see Jesus restoring things at the temple. I see Jesus coming up to a lady at the well who'd been married five times and who'd ventured out at the hottest part of a day. He was a Jew, she was a Samaritan. They weren't supposed to be even talking to each other. She was a woman, he was a man. They weren't even supposed to be talking to each other according to religious custom. But Jesus was so consumed with restoration. He shifted from religion and culture and the opinion of man and he restored that woman at the well and she became a soul winner in the kingdom of God. As I mentioned earlier, the apostle Peter, isn't it funny? We act so surprised when someone falls into sin and we, I mean, we, we just gotta get over our religious spirit, friend. It doesn't even surprise me anymore. We just gotta get over ourselves. I mean, the apostle Peter was the first pastor of Jerusalem. I mean, here's a guy that's cutting off an ear. He's the guy that said at Caesarea Philippi, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, he's done all of this. But then when he's crucified, Jesus, he denies him and had to be restored. You can have passion one minute and be caught up in something you're ashamed of the next. That is why we friend must be focused on beloved identity, our divine call, which is the ministry of restoration, as well as generational legacy. That's what God has called us to in this season. That's what we as a church need to be committed to, the God way. Remember when the woman was caught in adultery, they were supposed to stone her. Jesus started writing something. Slowly but surely, those, those religious men started leaving. There's been much debate about what he was writing, but I think he knew who in that group had been sleeping with her too. Come on. I tell you, I've lived in this thing a long time. I've seen my fair share of nonsense, but I'm telling you, the greatest thing you could ever do for someone in your family or someone in this community is restore them back to their original identity who God created them to be, give them a purpose that cannot be shaken and introduce them to a loving father that will never leave them and never forsake them. When all else fails in their life, if they'll look to the father through his son, Jesus, that will change their heart. It will restore to them the joy of their salvation. It will put a new ring on their finger and robe on their back and purpose in front of them. That is who God is, friend. He is a God of restoration. Would you bow your head and close your eyes today? Maybe you need to be restored today. Maybe you need to be saved today. Maybe you need a second chance today and you felt like you weren't qualified for a second chance, but you've heard this message and you realize that God's not finished with you yet, that God loves you with an everlasting love. 
that's you, under the sound of my voice with every head bowed, as you're doing intimacy with God in this place or you're watching online, if you need Jesus in your life, just pray this prayer with me. You say, Lord Jesus, restore the joy of my salvation. And that's for those of you who are saved. If you've blown it, just say, Lord, re restore to me the joy of my salvation. I own what I did. Forgive me of my sins. And Lord, if you'll forgive me and restore my joy, I'll get back to work for you in the days ahead. I'll get back to work for you in the days ahead. And I will teach people about your everlasting love. And I'll teach them their identity, if that's you. In just a moment, when our pastors come down, I want you to come and tell us so we can celebrate your comeback with you. But some of you, you've never even been saved. So we can't pray to God to restore something you've never have had. You need a touch from God. Maybe you've lived your entire life chasing religion, chasing the world, chasing whatever. But today you feel the love of God just surrounding you. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Bible teaches that all we have to do with this love is accept it. That if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. So if you need salvation, not the restoration of your joy, but if you need to be saved, very similar prayer, just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Yeah, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. Come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. I'm gonna ask the pastors to make their way down front. I'll make my way down in just a moment. For those of you who'd like to learn about our church, you can do that at the end to my right and your left. But right now, I wanna do business with God. If you've received restoration today, you come down. If you prayed to receive Christ, you come down. You want a covenant with a family that's committed to restoration and grace, you can come down and join the church. But some of you, you have people in your life that you know, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has called you to restore. Y'all come on down, y'all aren't gonna bother me. Y'all have people in your life, some of you, that you know you're supposed to restore in your life. It could be that person at work that gets on your nerves. I mean it, everybody's got a person or two at work that gets on their nerves. God's called you. And I know the people at this altar are gifted in the spirit to pray with you, cast demons off you, and to help you be a great witness at the workplace, to be a person of reconciliation and restoration. Some of you, you're saved. You haven't committed any heinous crimes or sins or anything, but you just haven't been living to your full potential because you haven't been in the business of restoring people. Maybe you've got wrapped up in this media circus we live in today and you actually rejoice when people blow it. Well, I want you to come to the Lord today and ask the Holy Spirit to give you your divine purpose that flows from beloved identity that God has called you to a greater purpose and that is reconciliation. Would you stand on your feet? Others probably need to come down. I've got you standing. So be willing to walk with somebody down. Move around if you need to. Lift your hands up in this place. You need whatever you need from the Lord. You come down and get it right now. The Spirit's here. I feel it, the Spirit in this place like never before. It's been a while. We are a house of grace. And whenever we do what this house was built to do, there's a spiritual connection and power that comes. We are the Father's house. And prodigals today are getting freedom. So whenever we're in that perichoresis, that unity with God, there's a spiritual pull there. So I wouldn't leave here without getting mine from God today because there's a spiritual power and connection going on right now. Lift your hands up, Heavenly Father. Let them receive it. Let them embrace it. Let them own it. Let them embrace their purpose in you, Father. Father God, we're not going back to religion. Lord, we commit to kingdom. We commit to the work of the ministry. We commit to reconciliation and restoration. Lord, I pray that pastors will come from around the country to be restored, that business leaders will be restored in this place, that marriages will be restored in this place, that human beings will be restored in this place, that people will come here just like the pool of Bethesda and they'll get a stirring of the water, the waters of restoration, and they'll go back out of this place 
into other states, other regions, other pockets in this community. And they'll lift your light up, Jesus, because that's who you are. And that's what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You come and receive the ministry of the Spirit today as we worship.